What's up, everybody? Hey, we want to welcome all of our locations, everybody joining us online. Come on, church, let's welcome our whole family, no matter where you're joining us from. And we're thrilled that you're here. Next week is Easter, everybody. Easter, Easter, Easter. Easter looked a lot different last year. I was thinking about this. I was uh, on a stool right here with like three people. And um, it ain't going to be that way this year, all right? We, we get the opportunity to be together, and um, it's going to be a powerful time. And, and I know our team has put so much work into creating an experience that, um, that will just introduce people to Jesus. Most of all, I know our kids' ministry has been working overtime, creating an amazing experience. And, and the amazing dream team of this church will be serving. And, and it's going it's to be a powerful weekend, so I hope you're planning on bringing somebody, getting them in the house. I wanted to let you know, last week, I had the opportunity to be in Louisville with our Life Point Church in Louisville. <laughs> Telling you, seven weeks old. I told him, I said, it took us three years to get where you are in seven weeks. I mean, they're already baptizing people, already seeing people come to faith in Christ. The church is growing, thriving. It's doing it amazingly well. And and I just thank you for your generosity that is all about expanding the kingdom, sending people out. And uh, it's, it's really excited what's, what's happening there. You ready for the word today? Yeah. Come on, week four of Saints. Let's jump into it. I want to show you a verse that we've been working on in this series. And, and if you missed any of it, I would encourage you to go back and check it out on YouTube and online on the app. And if you're like new today or first Sunday in a while, don't worry, you won't be left in the dark. Um, you, you'll, you'll, you'll merge right into the highway with us, all right? Um, but this verse in Acts chapter two is where we've been working about in this series a series called Saints. We've been looking at what is the church, and, um, and, and we've been just pulling some things out of this text and talking about them. And so the Bible says this, they, being the church, um, this is the very first church, the New Testament church, they did what? They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread. Come on, y'all. Christians been eating a lot all the time. And to prayer. And it says this, everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. So they, they, got to, they gathered together. It's what we talked about in week one, they, that, that church is a gathering. And then in week two, we talked about this thing, the church is empowered supernaturally by the Holy Spirit. And so the, there was, they were in awe at the wonders and the signs. In other words, there were miracles happening. And can I tell you something? They didn't stop in the New Testament. You, you gotta know, you're in a church that still believes God is healing bodies, that he's setting people free, that he's, come on, that, that, y'all with me, we believe... He's still doing miracles. We believe the Holy Spirit is still at work. Um, and if you're like, oh, is this one of those weird Holy Spirit churches? Listen, the Holy Spirit doesn't make you weird. You were weird before you got the Holy Spirit. <laughs> the Holy Spirit doesn't make me better than you. It makes me better than me. How many of you know you need something that's better than you, right? And so all the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions and gave to anyone as need. We talked last week about this radical spirit of generosity, just generous lives that the New Testament church had. It said every day they continued, they met together in the temple. Come on, y'all only come to church on Sunday. They were going to church every day. So that they gathered in big groups. They broke bread in homes. So they did large gatherings like this. They met in small groups. Um, you thought that was our idea, it wasn't, it was the Bible's idea. And it says they met together glad and sincere hearts, they praised God, they enjoyed the favor of all the people. And listen to this, that's what I want us to focus on today. And the Lord added to their number daily. Somebody shout daily. daily. Come on, every campus, shout daily. daily. Added to their number daily those who were being saved. So the church was growing every day. And I just wanna say something at the get-go. Um, I grew up in Tennessee at the beginning that um, you need to understand is that it is God's will for his church to grow. God never meant for this to be a country club of us four and no more, some exclusive group that nobody could get in on. No, he decides for his church to grow. Are you one of those churches that's all about the numbers? Unashamedly, yes, for 16 years, been all about the numbers because every number is a name and every name is somebody that Jesus died to save. And so we absolutely are all about the numbers. We're gonna count the numbers, right? And so I wanna talk to you about this, adding to the church daily those who are being saved. Anybody here a, uh, a what for kind of person? Like someone asks you something and you go, what for? Anybody with me? Like, like you've gotta understand the, the motive before you're gonna get on the mission, 
Are you with me? Like, you got to understand the purpose before you're going to engage in what they're asking you to engage in. I'm, I'm this kind of person. I had this moment yesterday with uh, my family. We went to a restaurant for lunch yesterday. It's a beautiful day. We were like, gorgeous day outside. Let's get the kids outside, the whole circus, all four of them. And if you don't know, we have four kids from 14 to 2. I don't like kids. I like my wife. So that's... <laughs> I love my kids, actually. But um, so 14 to 2, and it's like we, we were like, um, this would be great to go to a restaurant. I think there'd been enough time since we had tried it before, so our memory had escaped us of what it was like last time. And so like, well, I'll go to a restaurant. It'll be beautiful. We'll go walk her a little bit and get out. And um, so we get in the restaurant, and halfway through, I'm, I looked at her, and I go, why did we do this again? <laughs> like, why did we do this again? One is over here crying, the two-year-old. And YouTube Kids isn't sufficing him. His uh, Toy Story Woody figurine that has no legs isn't sufficing him, which that always does, because this kid gets up. You walk in his room, he's standing in the crib, and he's like, Woody, Buzz, Rex, Woody, Buzz, Rex. Like, that's the first thing he grabs. He brings it to the breakfast. I mean, everywhere we go with it. Woody wasn't sufficing him. YouTube Kids didn't work. I gave him my phone. Like, here, buddy, YouTube Kids. Like, let's just make it through the meal. Um, without disturbing everybody else who's paying for a meal right now. Anybody, any parents ever feel like, come on. And so let's just make it through that. And, um, and I just looked at her, I was like, why'd we do this again? She was like, never again. <laughs> never again. They'll get to eat out when they're older. <laughs> Not in our house. Like when they're ready to pay for it, they can come. Other than that, it's just me and you, right? This is the conversation I have with my older two and they're like, especially my, my second born, my daughter, when she's like, hey dad, will you buy me? It's always something, clothes, uh, I need a new swimsuit for the summer. And I'm like, okay, what for? Uh, if you'll explain to me why I'm gonna buy you new clothes because your current ones are on the floor in your room and you walk over them and all the parents said, amen. amen. <laughs> First time, some of you have never amen before, but you amen on that, I got you. <laughs> And so I, I, wanna, I wanna talk to you about this season of Palm Sunday and Easter, what for? Like why? why? Why did God put on human flesh in a form of a baby and come into the earth? Why, why did he live for 30 years and then a year around his 30th birthday began a public ministry where he healed the sick and fed the hungry and raised the dead and taught these mind-blowing principles and, and why, why did he come over the Mount of Olives and on Palm Sunday and, and make that march, knowing that he was marching to his death? It wasn't a surprise to him. He wasn't caught off guard. Why the Garden of Gethsemane? Why did he pray and great drops of blood come from his forehead because of the pressure that he was under? It's a real medical condition that can happen. Why, why did he do that? Why, why did he go to the cross? Why? Why did he die a criminal's death when he was no criminal at all? Why nails in his hand? Why a crown of thorns on his head? Why a spear in his side? Good news, he got up three days later. Spoiler alert. That's, spo I know that's next Sunday's message. He gets up, everybody. Um, <laughs> spoiler alert. But why? Why? And I would propose it's this is because the Son of Man came, this is his words, not mine, to seek and to save the lost. I, I, I've got, I've got, I, I have to have you understand that, that this whole season isn't, um, he didn't come to make life better for us. Although I would propose that when Jesus is first in your life, it's better, not easier, but better. And he didn't come to create a country club of us four and no more. He didn't come to create some exclusive thing that only the saints could be, a part, the, the people that, that we think are really good in our mind can be a part of. No, he came to seek and to save the lost. He came to hang out with the woman who was caught in the act of adultery. He came to hang out with Zacchaeus who was hated by everybody because he robbed people of their taxes. He came and they made comments about him. He's a glutton and a drunkard and he's a friend of sinners. He came to be a friend of sinners. He came to let all of humanity know that there is room at the table of God. If you'll join the family, you can pull yourself up. No matter your past, no matter your sin, no matter the shame or the guilt, he came to say you don't have to carry those things. He came that you might have life and have it to the full. And I think this is so 
perfectly illustrated in this New Testament account of Jesus and interacting with this guy named Philip and, and Nathaniel. And so I want to talk to you about this today, and I want to give you real just... Honestly, three really simple thoughts, but how many of you know that sometimes our, the simple principles applied have the most profound results? So I'm going to give you real, three real simple thoughts that I think if you'll apply them could change your life for the good and potentially change the eternity of people around you. And so I want us to enter this story, and the Bible says this. It says, the next day, Jesus decided to leave for Galilee. Now, Galilee is the region in Jerusalem where Jesus did most of his earthly ministry. It's the Sea of Galilee. Maybe you've heard that. Um, it's where Capernaum is. That was his like, base of operations, and, and all kinds of stuff happened in uh, if you're looking at the Sea of Galilee, like between 9 o'clock on a clock and 3 o'clock, like that's, that's pretty much where he spent all of his time. And the Bible says this, finding Philip, he said to him, follow me. And then it gives us a little like, connection, how Philip fixed in the picture. Philip, like Andrew and Peter, was from the town of Bethsaida. Here's what I want you to notice. Finding Philip, he said, follow me. Finding Philip, he said, follow me. If you're a note taker, write this down. If not... Write it down. Thought number one is this, is that God invites us. The text said that Jesus found Philip. It's really important for all of us to understand this, that in our Christian walk, we have to get this framed up in our mind, is that, is that God is searching for us. And I, I know we say phrases like, um, maybe if you're a Christian and you would say, yeah, in my 20s, I found God. And I understand the concept of what you're saying, but I want you to know that we don't find God because he ain't lost. We, we were the ones that, the Bible used this metaphor that we were the ones that were lost. Jesus wasn't lost, Philip was lost. God isn't lost, you, you were lost. So I understand the sentiment that I came to a place where I realized I needed Jesus and, and I surrendered my life to him and so I found God in that moment. But in reality, we've gotta get this understanding that there was nothing in us that was searching for God. We were searching in a whole lot of other areas to fill the need on the inside of us and God in his mercy and his grace came searching for us. And some of you, he came looking for you through your praying mama. He came looking for you through your best friend. He came looking for you through your college roommate. He came looking for you through somebody in your high school. He used someone, but it was God that came looking for you. And it's, why is it so important, Pastor, that we get this? Because of this. Because it'll frame our life. It'll frame our worship. All the praise I have goes to you. Why, God? Because when I could not look for you, you came looking for me. Why do I want to serve somebody? Because when God came looking for me, when I could never come looking, and so all I want to do in response to him is worship. In response to his kindness to me is serve him. I want to live with a generous spirit. Why? Because God came looking for me when I could not help myself. God invites us. God invites us. Think about that. With all of our brokenness and all of our mistakes and all the pain and, and all the things that we've done that has produced guilt and shame in our life, in spite of all that, God goes, I still am inviting you. I just want you to know that the table of God isn't for people that have lived a certain life. It's for everybody. It's not for those who have jumped through certain religious hoops. It's for every, God's inviting all of us. Finding Philip. Philip didn't find Jesus. Jesus found Philip. And can I tell you something? He's still in the business of finding people. The Son of Man came to seek and to save. To seek. Philip didn't run up to him and go, hey, Jesus, can, can, I, can I be in your crew? Can, can I follow you? As a... No, no, Jesus went looking for him. And he's still in the business of seeking. I would just propose that, that if we as a church are gonna be in on what Jesus is in on, it's on making space at the table and going, 
Come one, come all, whoever is in need, come and pull yourself up to the table. There is plenty of room, there is plenty of food, there is plenty of grace, there is plenty of mercy, there is plenty of forgiveness. God invites us to the table, are you following me? And he said, follow me. I love that he keeps it simple. If God had found me and said, Daniel, do this, jump through that hoop, go to this thing, perform that. No, he just said, just, just come follow me. He didn't say finding Philip, he called him to be perfect. He just said, come follow me. Just come on the journey. We'll work on things as we go. But just follow me. Are you following me? Did you get that? Look what happened as soon as, as soon as Jesus found Philip. Look, look what Philip did. Philip found Nathaniel. Every time someone encounters Jesus in the scripture, they immediately want to go tell someone what they experienced. And he told him, he said, he said, we found the one Moses wrote about in the law and about whom the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And then Nathaniel says this, Nazareth, can anything good come out of that? And then Philip says back to him, come and see. So do you see the progression? Philip gets in the presence of Jesus and something changes in him. And his next thing, the next thing he wants to do, like from from. The last verse to this verse, not like four chapters later, three years later, two months later, immediately he meets Jesus and he goes, got to get my buddy Nathaniel to him. I'm going to go find him. And then Nathaniel says to him, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Here's the principle I want you to see is that God invites us and we should bring others. We, we, we shouldn't be stingy with the grace of God that's been given to us. We should invite others to experience it as well. We should bring others. I almost said God invites us and we should invite others. But, but I think the concept here is that Nathaniel brought, or Philip brought Nathaniel to Jesus. He, he didn't just invite him. He didn't just say, service is at nine, bro, come on, Pastor. Come on. if you want to come. No, he said, come on with me, come and see. Can I tell you something? Is that all of you have been strategically placed in a certain sphere of influence. You may not see it this way, but you all have, every one of you. I don't have any influence, yeah, you do. You're in a neighborhood, your kids are on a soccer team, you're in a PTO, PTA, QRZ, like you're, You're in a certain cubicle and you're like, no, no, I'm in those places because I bought that house. I registered my kids for that school. I got that job. No, no, no. God put you there. Nothing's by accident in your life. God put you there. God put you in that situation. God put you in that moment. And why did he put you in there? Because he needs a mouthpiece for heaven. He wants to work it and through you. He found Philip so Philip could go find Nathaniel. And if you've been found, I've heard it said this way, found people find people. If you've been found, it's your responsibility and even I would say your opportunity to go find others. Because here's the reality, is that the places God has put you of influence, you are somewhere on somebody's spiritual journey. Everybody in all creation is on a spiritual journey, all of them. Atheists are on a spiritual journey. Agnostics are on a spiritual journey. People that believe there's a God but aren't really engaged, kind of living life, they're all on a, everybody, everybody is on a spiritual journey because God created you in the image of God and as an image bearer, there's something in you, whether you know it or not. And that's why some turn to money, some turn to pleasure, some turn to work, some turn to accomplishments to try to feed that craving. And your part of their journey may be to plant the seed 
that God loves you, that Jesus died for you. Somebody else may have planted the seed. You don't even know about them. It was at their last job. It was the last neighbor they had. It was, it was the friend at school. It was the college roommate from 15 years ago that just the life and the example they lived in front of them planted the seed of the gospel, and it's been planted in there a while, and you may have come along, and God is just like, I just want you to throw some water on it. And somebody may have already planted, somebody may have all of, already have watered, and you may get the joy. You may get the unbelievable privilege of seeing the harvest of that seed, of, of the love of God consuming their life and changing their life and setting them free from all their yesterdays so they can be everything God wants them to be in all of their tomorrows. You may be, I don't know and you don't know, but our job is to bring them along. Our job is to go, maybe I plant, maybe I water, maybe I get to see the harvest, but either way, I'm gonna be a part of it. And see, some of us, though, we have roadblocks to doing that, like, what if they ask me a question about the dinosaurs and when they live and <laughs> where'd they all go? And maybe you could just take Philip's cue, come and see. Is that really that hard? Yeah. What if they start asking me about, like, what does the Bible teach about this and that? And I, I, don't, I don't even know all that. Come and see. Listen to me, no one has ever been debated into the love of God. But man, they have been loved into the love of God. They have been cared into the love of God. Are you following me? Our, our job isn't to go debate and berate, it's to, it's to love people so much that we go, I don't know, all I know is that I got in the presence of this man named Jesus and it changed my life and the first thing I could think about is I want you to have that and I want you to have that and I want you to have that and I want everybody I know to have that and so I don't necessarily know all the answers but what I do know is I've met a man that changed everything and his name is Jesus. I'm not encouraging you to in Introduce them to your church or to your favorite podcast. Or it's Jesus that changes lives. Are you following me? He just said, hey, come and see. I don't know. Now, would it require you to get out of your comfort zone? Maybe. But couldn't we love people well enough to go, you know, that person beside me at work, at least once a week, they're talking to me about how they're just not sure if this week the marriage is going to make it. Why wouldn't you bring them to the one who can heal that? And, and, and at least once a week, they're, my friend at school is talking about the anxiety they feel and the depression and sometimes the ideations of not even wanting to live. Why wouldn't you bring them into the presence of the one who can set yes, all that free? Yes. Anything good come from Nazareth? I don't know, but come and see. I love, Philip was like, I, I, I don't know. No geography buff. All I know is this is the guy the prophets wrote about. And it's changed my life. If Jesus has changed your life, why wouldn't you invite people into that journey with you? Well, Pastor, what if they get offended at an invitation to church? One, I've never had anybody get offended. And two, I would illustrate it this way. You make it a point to invite people in your life into the moments that mean the most to you. You invite people into the moments in your life that mean the most to you. And you do it unashamedly. And when you do, people don't get offended. Like, I've never got a wedding invitation, opened it, and thought, what jerks. <laughs> Who do they think they are inviting me to their wedding? <laughs> Unbelievable. The gall they have to put this in my mailbox. 
No, I open it and I try to look at the calendar and go, can I figure this out? I really want to make this work. Does it fit in my schedule? Am I in town? Am I able to? I really want to be there. Why? Because this is a meaningful moment to them. If they know in your life, if they know that Jesus means that much to you, then it's not offensive for you to invite them into the moments that mean the most to you. See, I've always seen church like this, like we're in a partnership. That God wants his church to grow. It's not about how big, it's about populating heaven and plundering hell. And God wants his church to grow, he wants people to be reached. And I've always seen this in this partnership, that this amazing team, this amazing dream team at every location and the dream team online, you know what they're gonna do? They're, they're gonna create the very best experience for your friend, your family member that's gonna walk through the door for maybe the first time, or that you're gonna invite into your living room, maybe you're not comfortable coming back yet, then have church in your living room, invite some family in. They're gonna create this amazing experience, and, um, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna I'm gonna do the best that I possibly can with the help of the Holy Spirit to make the, the gospel, the good news of Jesus, as clear as I can. I'm gonna try to be funny, but not too funny. Like serious, but not overly serious. You know? It's always those Sunday that people come up and they're like, Pastor, my friend's here. I know what that means. <laughs> Don't screw this up. <laughs> I know. I'm with you. I get it. I understand. Did he just say, screw this up? I did. <laughs> and then at the end, here, here's what's gonna happen. It says, when Jesus saw Nathanael approaching, he said to him, here's a true Israelite and, and where there's nothing false. What a great compliment from Jesus. And he said, how do you, um, how do you know me? Nathanael asked. He's like, you don't know me. Jesus answered, I saw you while you were still under the fig tree before Philip called you. And you're like, what does that have to do with anything? Jesus was telling Nathaniel something about himself that only Nathaniel knew. And so then Nathaniel declared, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You're the king of Israel. See, God invites us, we bring others, and then here's what we do. We trust God to do the rest. I've never saved anybody, <laughs> never healed their marriage. You've never. I've never set somebody free from an addiction. Only the power of God does that. And I'm just telling you, if you'll do your very best to get people into the presence of God, we'll trust God to do the rest. And here's what I found, is that when you commit to get people into the presence of God, God has a way of telling them things about themselves that only they know. And it changes them. He has a way of taking a message from whatever, God can use any mouthpiece he wants to. I'm grateful to God I get to be one in this season, but God can use any mouthpiece he wants. And he has a way of taking that message and speaking to things that the message didn't even talk about. something supernatural happens in the presence of Jesus, y'all. And so the, the, the weight isn't on you to, to find lost things. The weight is on you to bring them to Jesus. And Jesus does all the work. Because this is what he's been doing all along. He came to seek and to save. Finding Philip. Jesus wasn't lost, Philip was. Finding us. God wasn't lost, we were. And there are people all around you, in your school, homeroom, on your sports team, in your neighborhood that you work with, that are going through life. And there's an empty, lost feeling inside that only Jesus can fill. And God has strategically placed you in their life to bring them to Jesus and then trust God to do the rest. I was thinking about an experience Tammy and I had uh, seven years ago now. 
I think it, I think it articulates the heart of God in this subject. We'd been gifted a week in Mexico for our 10 year anniversary. Um, no kids for a week. It's the best week ever. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> And it, it was it was it was um, it was like a resort, but it had a bunch of other resorts and like a golf course. And um, some people lived there part of the year. Some housing and a little grocery store, a Starbucks, and um, and it was kind of in this larger compound. And so it was you know pretty large area, and there were sidewalks everywhere, and it was just beautiful. And so. I don't know what we were doing. We must have been on some health kick at the time because <clears throat> we were like, we're going to get up and go run tomorrow. You're like on vacation. You're going to work out. Something wrong with us. We know. So we decided to go for a run. And at that point, I was running a whole lot. Like I was doing half marathons and marathons. So um, I was running. I was just running a lot. And so Tammy's like, I'll run with you. And about, I don't know, a few miles into the run, she was like, I'm going to go back and um, back to the room. And I'll, by the time you're back, I'll be ready, and it takes me like 30 seconds to get ready, so we'll be ready to go. And, uh, and so <clears throat> she, she went back, and I headed on. I kept running a couple more miles, maybe 20, I don't know, 30 minutes more. And then I got back to our resort, and we were on the ninth floor, and so I went up, and I, I hadn't had the key with me. She had the key, and so I knocked on the door, and there was no answer on the door. And um, I was like, oh, she must be in the shower or something. And so I went down to the front desk and I was like, can I get a spare key? And so I got a key and I went back up and I went in and it's, it was a two bedroom condo. And um, actually, it, yeah, two bedroom condo. And I remember I went in, I was like, hey, Tammy. And, um, and then when I really want to get her attention, I say her uh, given name, I'm like, Tamra, Tamra. Um, and so I, Went into the one bedroom, I didn't see her. Went into the bathroom, went into the other bedroom, the other bathroom, I didn't see her. Went out on the balcony, I didn't see her out there. I'm kind of looking out because you can see the pools out there um, and through the trees a little bit. I couldn't see everywhere around the pool. And so I'm like, this is weird. Maybe she went down to the beach like without me. She got a head start. I was like, so I went down there. So I went through the lobby of the hotel and or the resort and, and walked out and the first pool is a kiddie pool and the second pool is like the adult pool and I didn't see around there. So I went out on the beach and I didn't see under any of the little huts. And at this point, I'm like a little concerned. Are you with me? And so I walk a little more briskly back to the lobby and I asked the guy, cause you kind of get to know the people at the front desk. And I said, have you seen my wife? And has she come through here? And he's like, no sir, she hasn't come through here. And I was like, okay. So the urgency is rising in me a little bit more. It's probably been 40 minutes by now since we parted ways. And all I'm like, she's a beautiful blonde and the cartel has her. Like, <laughs> that's immediately went where my mind, I, I, you know, that's where my mind went. Like traffic, I don't know. I just went to the worst case and that's where I go. Um, and so I, now I'm picking up my pace and I had just run, I don't know, three or five miles or so. I don't remember exactly how much, but I had the energy to run another 10. Are you following me? And the urgency is, is rising and my blood pressure is rising. And, and I run down to the, there's a Starbucks the opposite way. I run down there. I run back the path that we had run and I came back around. Just did I miss her somewhere on my way back? Did she twist an ankle? Is something gone? All I know is that I couldn't find my wife and there became an urgency inside of me. And at that moment, I didn't care about me. Like I didn't care if I was uncomfortable. I didn't care if I looked like I was crazy. I didn't, I didn't care about me. Me, all I cared about was finding her. And I just think that is the heart of God for his lost children. And I think, I think that's what God wants us to feel like. That we just don't casually stroll through life when there's hurting people and there's lost people and broken people, but we would have the urgency of the heart of the Father. I just wonder sometimes if God doesn't look down on his family, the church, and go, why aren't they out looking for them? Why aren't they running to the Starbucks and up nine flights of stairs and out to the pool? Why aren't they searching everywhere? Why are they concerned about their comfort? And why are they concerned about them when there's hurting, broken people all around? And I just wanna say that I came back to the resort and off the balcony, she yelled out my name and I quickly made it up nine floors. Are y'all following me? And I grabbed her and I was crying because what I had lost had been found. And I'm just telling you, 
that when God finds lost children, it gives that kind of joy to the heart of the Father. So if you've been found, if you've been found, bring that kind of joy to the heart of the Father by bringing other people into the presence of Jesus. And we will trust God to do the rest. Well, Pastor, what if I bring them to Easter and they don't raise their hand? We trust God to do the rest. Next week, maybe a sowing moment, maybe a watering moment. For some, it's gonna be a harvest moment. And I'm just telling you, you'll never experience church the same until you have someone sitting beside you that's far from God. You'll see it a whole lot different. And you'll have no better Sunday afternoon. Never again in your life will you have a Sunday afternoon like the afternoon after you see someone take a step towards Jesus. It's better than your team winning. It's better than receiving a blessing. It's, it's better than anything to know I just made a difference in someone's eternal destiny. Will you pray with me? Every head bowed, every eye closed. I'm sure if I were to walk around every one of you today, you could tell me someone in your life that is close to you, but they're far from God. And the reason they're close to you is because God has put you in their life. Well, no, I was born into that family. Who do you think put you in that family? And I'm the one that applied for the job and got it. Who do you think gave you the ability and the skills to apply and to get accepted? God put you there. You have a bigger purpose than you even know. You have a greater mission than you even realize. It's to bring others into the presence of Jesus. So here's the, the radical prayer I'm going to challenge you to pray right now between you and God. God, give me opportunity this week to bring them to you. For some of you today, the step that you need to take is, as I've talked, you've thought, I think I'm the one that's far from God. You're not confident that heaven is your home. You're not confident of your salvation, of your eternal destiny. And I just want you to know you don't have to live that way. You don't have to live life not knowing if you have peace with God. The Bible says that if anyone is in Christ, they're a new creation. All your old can pass away and everything become new in your life. And the Bible tells us how. It's not by trying harder, working harder, hoping your good will outweigh your bad. It says if you confess that Jesus is Lord, believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. That's how the lost are found, surrendering to Jesus. And maybe that's you today. Maybe you even say, Pastor, I've always called myself a Christian, but always in my heart, I felt far from God. Then today's your day. This is your moment. The grace of God is calling you. The table of God is large enough and it's inviting you. So with no one looking around, we're gonna pray in just a moment. I wouldn't embarrass you for the world at any campus online. Wouldn't point you out, nothing like that. I just wanna know who I'm praying with. If you say, Pastor, include me in that prayer in a moment. I wanna have peace with, I wanna know for certain. If that's you, I'm gonna count to three. I just want you to shoot your hand up high. And you can put it back down. Just on three. You lift it up high. One, two, three. Every location. God bless you. God bless you. You can put them down. I'm gonna ask all of us to pray out loud. We just believe here nobody prays alone. And so church, I'm gonna ask you at every campus, even if you're joining us online, to pray out loud for the benefit of those who just lifted their hands saying, that's me today. I need that, want that. And so let's pray. Just say, Jesus, I need you. I ask you to forgive me of all my sin. I believe you died for me. 
I believe God raised you from the dead. Today I make you my Lord and Savior. In Jesus' name, everybody said amen, amen. Come on, let's celebrate those who just made that decision. Hey, hope today's message was helpful for your life. I wanna tell you, you should subscribe. The reason why, you can get content pushed to you all the time. You don't have to wonder if you ever missed anything. And also, I want you to think about giving. By giving, you can help us take this message to so many other people that are in need of some hope, need of some encouragement, and you can be a part of making a difference in the life of so many people. Look forward to seeing you right back here next time.